All right. So, uh, first of all, thank you for coming to the talk. This is policy as code across the stack. This is really uh, an ongoing research project of mine uh, over the last couple of years now, especially with different technologies and what uh, and what you would consider as code, right? So, this is something that I've constantly been working on in different places, and uh, I train on this stuff. I talk about this stuff. And I'm going to talk about a couple of things uh, in this talk because I don't have too much time. So first of all, an introduction of myself. My name is Abhay. Uh, I run two companies. One is a security services company called V45 and also a training platform called AppSec Engineer. Uh, so we kind of have the best of both worlds where we see a lot of things happening in the real world and use those things that we see happening in the real world to build out training labs and so on. So a lot of this is based on real world stuff and I'll be showing you some labs from our environment as well. Uh, I train a lot, I, uh, I do a lot of work in the AppSec automation space, the cloud native space. Uh, my job started off in mostly offensive security about 12, 13 years ago, but now it's largely moved towards uh, scaling application security, scaling uh, cloud security and so on and so forth. So that's really what I do. I tr I've trained at Black Hat, I continue to do a lot of training and speaking at Black Hat and so on. Um, I wish I could have been sensible like most other speakers and recorded my demos, but I decided, you know, why, why be difficult when you can be impossible? And I decided to do live demos. And I have to, uh, you know, send out a prayer to the demo gods just before uh, <laughs> I do it, because I do have a couple of live demos in my talk, and, you know, as live demos go, things can go horribly wrong. Um, anyway, let's get started. So today's agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about the promise of DevSecOps, and I already see some people nodding their head and saying, no, there's no, DevSecOps has not delivered on any of its promises, and I, I hear you, and uh, a lot of places it has not, and we'll talk a little bit about that, the need for this, of course, we look at it across the stack, but I'll really be focusing on two stories. The real focus of this talk is these two stories and what the, uh, the examples that I'm going to talk about here. I'm going to look at it uh, from the application and API gateway. I'm going to look at it on cloud native control planes, especially on Kubernetes, and then, of course, some conclusions. Now, the promise of DevSecOps has really been this, right? We've, we've been told you can have both speed and safety, and yes, in some cases, we've had that. Uh, a lot of people expect zero false positives. It, of course, doesn't happen. That is uh, at least the idea of what we are going towards, but it, of course, always doesn't happen that way. And of course, the collaboration thing is another major thing that we have always talked about with DevSecOps. Right? It's not just a silo, but uh, how many of us have built another silo as DevSecOps? I'm sure a lot of people have, and they continue to do this uh, as well. So a lot of times that collaboration message is kind of lost. And we always talked about paved roads. A lot of us talk about secure defaults and paved roads. But most of the time, the roads that we are going on kind of look like this, right? Um, th this was generated by Dali, by the way, when I said uh, generate something which is a dirt road where somebody's sitting and coding on it, and that's what it generated. Uh, so uh, what we have seen largely is that a lot of times, uh, the promise of DevSecOps has not really lived up to the reality of DevSecOps for a lot of us. And that is also because we've been kind of blitzed by this whole move to cloud native, distributed systems, microservices, the APIs. It's become quite complicated to secure a lot of this. And that has moved at a much faster pace than our security initiatives have. Right? So this is, this is a very common story for a lot of us. We've had development teams moving at a rapid pace, and we've not had security being able to catch up to that pace, and that's why we have this. A lot of times we, we want those paved roads, but those paved roads are not there for us. Now, today I'm going to talk about some approaches that you can use. Again, this is an idea talk, which means that obviously not everything you, uh, you hear in this talk are ideas that you can take and maybe do something with it. So that's really what this talk is about. It's not necessarily a thing saying, okay, this will work exactly this way for you. That's never going to work, right? It's everybody's use case is different. Everybody's organization is different. The bureaucracy within that organization is different. So obviously, the uh, things change. Things are different based off of all of this, all of these variables. Now, let's specifically talk about one set of problems, especially related to APIs and where they're deployed, which is typically on cloud-native infrastructure, 
in this case, I'm going to be looking at Kubernetes as a large example. So according to the numbers, 88% had API authentication issues. This was from the Palo Alto API security report. Uh, the API security top 10 uh, from OWASP uh, has the broken auth object level and property authorization. Authorization is a pretty big problem with APIs. I'm sure a lot of you will agree with me, right? Authorization, authentication is also a problem, but I think beyond authentication, authorization is the bigger issue. And I think the reasons for this are pretty clear, right? Because let's say you're building five different services or five different APIs. The way you would roll out authorization for those five, even though they may be using a homogenous authorization mechanism, would be completely different. One team would do a great job of authorization, the other team would do a completely terrible job of authorization. And there is this massive inconsistency that you see between these teams working on authorization, especially or any other type of validation and authorization and so on. So really what the as code movement wanted us to do is really come up with things as code, right? So you have your SAST as code, DAST as code, uh, policy as code, your infrastructure as code. The idea is that you have, it's in version control, it's a single source of truth, it's scalable, you can automate it, you can test it, it's consistent and it's reproducible. That's really what we want from the as code thing. You should be able to compose things that you can use to do all of these things. And of course, it should be something that we can continuously improve on. It should be high fidelity, especially when you're looking at things like SAST, where you don't want too many false positives. The SAST rules, the SAST as code, which you're seeing with the rise of SEMgrep and CodeQL and all of these folks, is really high fidelity rules that should help you identify actual security issues and not uh, throw a mountain of false positives at your door, right? So that's really what you want with the as code movement. Now. When you look at your typical DevSecOps, uh, your DevSecOps cycle, your DevSecOps snake in this case, uh, you're, you're really, what you want is security embedded at multiple stages of the cycle, right? It's, it's really that. It's, it's what you, would, you used to previously call a secure SDLC or whatever it is. You might have multiple names for it, but this is what it really breaks down to. Right? You want to be able to embed security feedback loops at different stages of the SDLC. And that's really what DevSecOps is all about, being able to embed these feedback loops at different stages of the SDLC. In my view, as code plays a very important role because you can embed different parts of as code in different stages of the SDLC. And some of it, we're already seeing the rise of, I'm sorry, the animation is kind of, oh, it's slower with, okay. So the idea here is that you have multiple places where you can plug in your either customized or pre-built or things that have already been composed as code in different stages of the SDLC, right? If you look at it today, we have detection engineering happening at a, in a big way because of things like your Azure Sentinel with KQL and things like that, you're seeing detection engineering become a pretty big thing. Yara, Sigma, all of that stuff is really all about what we're seeing detection engineering as code, right? We're able to compose this as YAML and be able to put this out and you know do uh, detection engineering on top of that. We can do, uh, SAST as code has also become a reality today because you're able to compose custom rules, you're able to uh, create custom definitions, custom uh, plugins on top of existing tools with for multiple languages. You're seeing this with SEMgrep, you're seeing this with CodeQL. Threat models as code uh, has also become a nascent reality. I don't think it's as adopted as we'd like it to be, but it is something that we're seeing. In fact, OWASP has its own threat modeling as code project, which is the PyTM project, and there are other projects out there that do this as well. I'm gonna be talking specifically about policy as code. Now, policy as code, uh, is really all about being able to enforce some kind of an automated policy at a certain um, at a certain gateway point, right? So typically, this would be at your application gateway, or in your cloud control plane, or in, one, in some of these areas, right? So this is really what policy as code is all about, and it's largely around access control, but it doesn't always have to be around access control. It's largely around access control, but doesn't always have to be around access control. So let's look at what you can do with policy as code across the stack. Uh, 
So the idea here with policy as code is that it is purpose built. It's not, so what you would do typically, let's say you wanted to implement authorization in a bunch of APIs. You would previously do essentially this, right? You would essentially hard code all the authorization rules in the API, and then you would hope that those authorization rules work well, and they essentially enforce the authorization based off of this. The idea here is not to do that, because one team might do a great job of authorization rules and implementing authorization that is hard coded, the other team might do a terrible job. So it's inconsistent, especially in a distributed system. So the idea is to not hard code security rules. It's purpose built, which means that it is oriented towards high performance. It's meant only for that, right? Policy as code is meant only to enforce policy, create policy and enforce policy. That's basically what it's meant for. There is nothing else that it's supposed to do. And that's really why it's purpose built. So you, you should be able to get your policy decision very quickly because you have policy as code. It's testable. You can run it through unit tests. You can run it through a CI CD pipeline. Because it's testable, you're also able to validate it a lot faster than you would hard-coded authorization rules. Imagine having to test all kinds of authorization conditions against a web application. It's almost never going to happen that easily. And it's also, of course, scalable because it can be rolled out across a distributed system without you having to tear your hair out. Right? And the idea here is to create that paved road for engineering teams. If you are able to roll this out for an application at the API gateway, without the application having any context of what authorization it actually has to deal with, that's great, because the, the, the development teams can just focus on the business logic and the authorization, the authentication, the validation entirely happens at the gateway. You don't really need to think about it from that standpoint in the application itself. So you've already seen some of these things that you can do. We have seen it even at the host level. So a lot of the stuff that we're doing with eBPF uh, and runtime security uh, controls at the host is something like this. We're going to look at a different example today, of course, but these are some examples of policy as code. So really, if you look at it, policy as code can be applied anywhere, right? You can apply it at the application level. You can apply it at the gateway level. You can apply it on the cloud control plane that you're running on. So even if you're running on AWS or Azure or GCP or what have you, you have the ability to do service control policies or uh, you know, cloud policies that you can enforce in Kubernetes. We're going to look at an example of Kubernetes today. You can also use Kubernetes policy management tools to be able to do that. At the workload level also, you can start enforcing uh, this with policy as code. The idea is to have a purpose-built set of security tooling that you're using across the stack. That's really what it's about. So this is just another representation of that. At, at this level, you're doing some of this stuff. Inside the host, you're doing some of this stuff. So that's really an example. But I'm going to really take you through two examples today. The first one is going to be our, um, our an application stack that we're going to deploy. Now imagine this. You have a whole bunch of microservices. Uh, or APIs that you're running, and you have to think about all of these things, right? You have to think about the business logic of your service. You have to think about authorization. You have to think about validation. You have to think about object access control. You have to think about authentication. You have to think about logging. Now, when different teams are responsible for different services, it's very hard to enforce consistency for all these things. And there are more. I've just Whatever fit in the slides is all I could put. Uh, so <laughs> there are way more than this. But the point here is that you have to think about all of these things. So the idea of policy as code is why not take out some of these responsibilities and put it on to specific purpose-built products that are meant for this. So let's look at how we can do that. So this is our conceptual example that I'm going to talk about today. This is something we've implemented. A, a variation of this is something we've implemented at one of our customers. So the idea here is that you have an API gateway, which is essentially the gateway for a bunch of web services. And that is essentially, the API gateway is hooked up to a policy service, which is using Open Policy Agent. How many of you use Open Policy Agent or work with Open Policy Agent? OK, a few of you do that. It's great. So Open Policy Agent is something I want to talk about in a little bit. And Open Policy Agent helps you deploy static policies. It helps you run static policies. Uh, which you can use to validate uh, anything from routes to uh, paths to even tokens and do authorization checks. And you are hooking up the open policy agent to a dynamic authorization service that can do dynamic 
object level access control. And none of these applications have any idea of these controls. The, the, the idea is that these are built just with business logic in mind. Everything in terms of authorization and authentication is done by the API gateway. So that's the example we want to talk about now. Now let's talk about some of the ways in which we're going to do this. And I'm going to talk about the technologies we're going to use here. The first thing we're going to use is Open Policy Agent. Uh, and the second one we're going to use is a library called Casbin. Anyone heard of Casbin here? It's very little known, unfortunately, but I wish it would get, uh, I hopefully more of you start thinking about it and using it after today. All right, so let's talk about Open Policy Agent. Now, Open Policy Agent is a policy management framework. You can use this for composing policies for anything, right? Literally for anything. You, uh, people have used this for composing policies on Kubernetes. People have used this for composing policies on the kind of SSH host that you should allow inside a Linux machine. The idea is very simple. You get a request. The request is passed over to Open Policy Agent, which can be running either as a binary or as a server. The Open Policy Agent gets this request. It checks whether a policy matches for the request that is coming in. If the policy matches, Open Policy Agent says, I accept it. If the there is no policy of this nature, it says, don't deny. There is no policy of this nature, and you can deny that request. Very simple operation, but it's truly uh, amazing what you can do with uh, Open Policy Agent. Now, Open Policy Agent requires you to use its own uh, domain-specific language that it has. It's called Rego. Uh, we'll look at some examples of Rego, and uh, that's, uh, that's what you need to use for Open Policy Agent. So you get a request, it passes to Open Policy Agent, which can be running as a server or as a binary, uh, however you want to deploy it, whatever works for you. And then, of course, you can, it checks against the policy. If it matches the policy, it uh, comes back with a decision, which is an accept decision, or it comes back with a fail decision. Right? So Rego, you can do a whole bunch of things. The, and every expression in Rego with Open Policy Agent evaluates to a Boolean, which is either true or false. Right? So every expression. So it's very simple that way. It's, it's a policy engine that just evaluates to true or false. So all the rules that you compose evaluate only to true and or true or false. Right? So, that is, uh, so this is an example in this case. We're checking whether somebody's trying to read a resource called protected if that is, that is what they're trying to access from the request. It allows it, otherwise it disallows it. Um, this is, again, uh, the default allow is false, and you can, it's a very similar rule. Uh, the default allow is true. You can check whether the user.role is admin. If it is, even you can enforce functions, you can use functions that will start to check whether that is the case or not. Uh, you can you can validate strings. You can validate uh, not only strings, but you can also validate. You can split strings. You can do a whole bunch of things with it. You can validate tokens. So it uh, so you can pass it a jot, and you can validate the jot, and check all the claims on the jot, and entirely validate whether that jot is a valid thing before you even allow that particular request to access your application or not. Right. So this is basically what you can do with Open Policy Agent. It's, it's used in many places. It's used in Kubernetes. It's used in uh, OS policy management. It's used in Kafka topic authorization. It's used in several places. Now, open policy agent, as you would probably see, is static, right? It's basically you're, you've composed code, and it's static. These are static rules. But what you really want is dynamic authorization, right? So you want somebody to sign up. So let's say you have a, you have a system where users sign up to your system. And once they sign up to your system, they have access to certain things. Now, that's obviously dynamic. Based on that user, based on that user's privilege, based on that user's action, they should be only able to access this object or that object or some other object. That is dynamic. And open policy agent does not allow for dynamic policies like that. You should, you should compose it uh, as a static policy, and it doesn't have access to dynamic policy. This is where the next implementation that we're going to use comes in, which is essentially Casbin, right? So there are a lot of these frameworks that are out there that do this today. There's Casbin, which is the one I'm going to be talking about. There are others called, there's one from Oso, which is also open source. They have a commercial product as well. Amazon recently released their uh, uh, authorization as code framework called Cedar. You can use that with AWS, uh, with a specific product in AWS called Verified Permissions, which is quite an interesting uh, 
uh, product as well. So they've launched something in the same uh, line. And this was all really, a lot of this kind of was inspired by this uh, project called Google Zanzibar, which kind of was one of the older projects that, I don't think it was ever made into an official Google library, I'm not sure, but this was one of the projects that was used as a base reference to a lot of the other projects that have been spawned from this. So at its essence, it is really this, right? Object level authorization is this. You can cut it however you want. You can have roles, you can have attributes, you can have whatever. The idea of uh, object uh, level access control is this. Subject has access to object to perform an action on the object. Right? Now you can add some extra uh, magic on top, which is your role-based access control, which is essentially your subject divided into groups, uh, has access to a role, and that role has access to do something against a particular object. That is role-based access control. And then you have attribute-based access control, which is your subject can invoke a bunch of actions against the object with additional context between the uh, 9 AM and 5 PM Eastern. That's attributes, right? You can add additional attributes to that and have access control parameters set. Now, the idea here is that can you templatize this authorization as code? and roll this out so that your application doesn't ever have to deal with this in a way that it is completely plug and play. You just check this, the gateway gets a request and it checks whether this user with this particular token has access to do this. It sends it off to a policy database. It checks whether this exists in the policy database. If it exists in the policy database, comes back and pushes it to the API, to the end API. If it does not exist in the policy database, it just does not work, right? So that is the idea behind what we're trying to achieve in this example. So the approach is really this. You have a config, which is your authorization model, which is you composed as code. This, you have a policy that maps against this. You have a request that comes in from the user. You check whether the request matches the policy. If the request matches the policy, you have a result, which is a true or a false. Very simple. Nothing, nothing more, nothing less. Really breaks down to that at the end of the day. Right, so this is how uh, you do it with Google Zanzibar. You can write up definitions like so, and you can store this in the database. You can store the access control uh, policies in the database, and it just checks against this particular thing. Now, we are gonna use a library called Casbin. I like Casbin because I found it easier to work with as opposed to some of the other ones. And I'll show you how this works. Now, Casbin works like this, right? You essentially have a request definition, you have a policy definition, and you have a policy effect, and you have a matcher. So in this case, it says you have three attributes in the request. You have three attributes in the policy. If all the attributes match, then we have a true. If anything does not match, we have a false. Very simple, right? And you store the subject object action in a database or anything. You can store it in the file system. You can store it in the database. You can store it in wherever you want. The idea here is that it uses this model, checks against that database, and sees, okay, this is the request that's coming from the user. This, this user is trying to access object A to read object A. Is this in the database? Yes, no, not, throw it out, right? So that's the idea behind using Casbin. So in Casbin, you essentially have definitions written up like this, which you can store in the database. And from that point on, you can essentially start running entire dynamic access control as code based on Casbin. All right, so the idea today is we're gonna use OPA, Open Policy Agent, to do some static policy controls. We're going to hook it up to Casbin to do dynamic policy controls, and we're going to get a full access control system working at the gateway with the application having zero knowledge of this access control system. Okay, so let's look at our demo and actually see how it works. All right. So I'm just gonna take you through the demo. Uh, this is too much zoom. Right, so here we have, um, we have an example here. That, that's the example I'm talking about, uh, which is we have a API gateway which is called traffic. And traffic is the API gateway that allows us to access the APIs. And we have some OPA rules. And let's look at the OPA rules that we have. So we have some uh, rules that are written here, which is essentially somebody is trying to sign up, 
uh, then allow them to access this particular path. If its input method is get, then allow them to do this. They have some rules written out here, right? So if somebody is trying to sign up to the CRM, you, they need to sign up to the CRM, it has to be a post request. So that is a static rule, which means that if somebody tries to send a put request or a delete request to the CRM sign up method, it's not going to work. The gateway is going to reject it outright, right? Now, when somebody has to create a customer, they need to use this, uh, this endpoint. Then it needs to be a post request. And it needs to validate the JWT claims. So we are actually having a scenario where it's checking the JWT claims. It's checking whether there is a user claim inside the JWT that the user has sent to you. So you're actually doing all of this validation right here at the gateway level. Now on top of this, we are also adding a dynamic service. So essentially saying, whenever somebody tries to access some card data, whenever somebody tries to access a card data, check all of this other stuff, but ping my authorization, dynamic authorization service, and if it comes back with a 200 response, only then allow the user to access the card. Otherwise, throw the user out, right? So it's checking whether the get card is working, whether it's get user allowed or not, then checks whether status code is 200, so on, right? So it's actually calling this particular service, and it's passing the user, the, the object, and the action that wants to be done, and it's essentially checking whether it's allowed, not allowed, right? So that's something we're going to check for, okay? So now we are going to essentially check against this. We are going to, so this, the, we're going to do this dynamic access control model check for now. And I'm going to show you how that works. Oh, sorry. I just need the instructions because this is in one of our labs. So that's the reason. Yeah. All right. So the idea here is we have a system where the user should only be able to access their own card data. That's the example here. The user should not, any other user, if they try to access this user's card data, it should be a disallow, right? So the idea here is we've already got an authorization service being pinged. And inside that, we have some rules that we have set up in the config, which is basically CASBIN. It says every request has a subject object action. Every policy has a subject object action. All of them have to match. Or if the subject is the root user, allow it. So if the subject is the root user, allow everything. But if it's any other user other than root, all the attributes of the request have to match all the attributes of the policy. That's the idea. All the attributes of the request, all the attributes of the policy. The policy is stored in MongoDB. So Casbin has a whole bunch of database adapters. You can store it in Mongo. You can store it in Postgres. You can store it in Dynamo. You can store it in whatever you want. Right? So the idea in this case is we're storing it in uh, uh, Mongo. Right, so we're essentially checking whether the uh, the three attributes are in the policy. If it's not there, it throws a result, uh, error. You're not uh, authorized to perform. Otherwise, it comes back with a 200 response. So let's see how this actually works. All right, so I'm going to just create a user. I'm going to sign up as the user. And oh, I'm going to sign up as the user first, and then I'm going to log in as that user. Logging in as that user. I've got a token. So this is a echo dollar TKN. This is the logged in jot that I have. Now I'm going to create a new uh, card number for myself in the system. It's going to be this. I've created a card. Now I'm going to sign up as another user, and I'm going to try and access this user's card. I'm signing up as another user, some other user, literally. And we're going to see whether I can access using my token. And remember, the application at any given point in time has no concept of authorization. All of this is being done at the gateway. There is nothing that the application even knows in terms of an authorization model. Right? So in this case, we have the uh, token. And then now, if we try and access the other user's card, which is Visa, it says, no, you're not authorized to access. 
it hit the gateway. The gateway essentially uh, pinged open policy agent. Open policy agent pinged our dynamic authorization service. The dynamic authorization for service didn't find any policy with this subject object action in there. Said no. Policy decision deny. Passed up the order. Policy decision deny. Right? So this is what you can, so this way you can enforce a lot of consistency with authorization, right? So especially when you have several services that have a homogeneous authorization model, you can literally deploy one single config for it to be able to start enforcing this at the gateway level, right? Or in a Kubernetes ingress or whatever it is you're looking at. So the idea here, and with Open Policy Agent, you are able to optimize performance quite a bit. Remember, it, it is a specialized language for policy. So the performance implications, I get this question a lot. Everyone talks about what are the performance implications of this? The performance implications can, with Open Policy Agent, we've generally seen the performance implications being negligible because it is meant for this. They are, you're able to optimize quite extensively for performance with Open Policy Agent. Now, I'm going to go to my the next example. I just have under 15 minutes, so I'm going to uh, go to the next one, which is around Kubernetes and cloud control planes. Now, with cloud control planes, policy management becomes essential because when you're rolling out, let's say, a Kubernetes cluster or even an AWS organizations or an a, a bunch of AWS organizations or Azure subscriptions or a bunch of Azure tenants or whatever it is, you are dealing with a lot of access control problems or possibilities that can have serious issues with access control, right? So the idea is that you want to roll out policies for that environment for you to be able to automatically start to validate certain things, right? So for instance, let's say you're running a bunch of Kubernetes cluster. You don't want images being loaded from container registries that are not yours, right? That, that's a very simple policy. Right? But if you don't have an automated policy management system in place, it's almost impossible for you to do this every single time. Right? You have to enforce it at the source code level. You have to do a lot of checks in and shift left. And that's great. That's fine. You should still do that. But you still have to have some kind of a policy within the Kubernetes cluster that says, hey, you are not supposed to pull container images from not this particular container registry. Anything from not this container registry, I'm going to deny, right? So now uh, you have a whole bunch of policy as code tools for cloud control planes. Each cloud provider has their own policy tools that they provide. So AWS has something called service control policies where you can essentially restrict what kind of services and what kind of access to certain types of services you want to allow within the concept of the whole AWS organizations. Azure has a very similar thing. GCP has a limited thing, but also has a very similar thing. You have to do a little bit of IAM uh, magic along with that policy stuff that you can do. Kubernetes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Kubernetes now. Kubernetes has a bunch of policy management tools that you can use. And of course, this is the AWS uh, service control policy. Azure has a very similar thing. Now, I'm going to talk about the Kubernetes policy management tool, which is the, probably the most popular right now, which is Kiverno. Anyone heard of Kiverno, using Kiverno? Yeah, a few of you using Kiverno. Kiverno is probably the most popular policy management tool out there for the Kubernetes ecosystem, simply because it is very easy for you to start managing policies on Kiverno, right? You don't, uh, previously you used to, I mean, it's still there. There is another product from Open Policy Agent itself called Gatekeeper. The reason that this project didn't get too much traction is because you needed to learn Open Policy Agent's language, which is Rego. And trying to learn Rego was not obviously easy for a lot of people. So Kiverno became the, the platform of choice simply because you were able to compose your policies in YAML itself. Just like you would compose a Kubernetes YAML manifest, you are able to compose uh, policies in YAML. So now Kiverno is really nice simply because it supports both kinds of validation. It supports both uh, validating uh, admission controller or validating uh, hooks, and it also supports mutating hooks. So for instance, let me give you an example of a mutating hook. <clears throat> let us say that you want to, so let's say you have a namespace in Kubernetes called production. Okay, and you only want containers launched in production to have a memory limit of, let's say, 500 meg, 
let's say people don't add that. A lot of manifests don't have that. You can essentially create a mutating control inside with Kiverno and say that anytime somebody tries to load a container in this namespace, restrict memory to 500. So it'll actually change the nature of the original request, restrict memory to 500 meg, and launch that container inside the cluster. So it not only validates, but it also able to mutate. And that's the uh, awesome thing about using Kiverno. Now, Kiverno has, uh, you can literally write it out in YAML, and I'll show you an example of a pretty simple Kiverno policy. You can match it against namespaces. You can match it against kinds. You can match it against labels. You can say that all the applications that have this particular label match this policy. So you can start to include very broad or very specific type of admission controls and policy controls with Kiverno, which you can use for mutating, validating, and so on. So this is a very simple Kiverno policy that essentially says, hey, every time somebody tries to launch something in any namespace in my Kubernetes cluster, it needs to have a purpose label. This is a very simple thing, nothing, nothing major in terms of security, right? But you can do security things. So you can essentially say that if somebody tries to launch a privileged container in the namespace, deny. Don't allow a privileged container to launch. Or if somebody tries to launch something with host PID, where there is no difference between the PIDs and the host and the PIDs that are, uh, there's no separation between the container PIDs and the host PIDs, do not allow that to happen, right? So you can have all those enforcements done. You can also set up a uh, mutation policy that says, anytime somebody tries to run a container, if the image pool policy is not, if not present, then set it to the latest whatever tag. In this case, that's the policy that we have. So I'm going to show you an example of Kiverno before we close today. And this is kind of oriented towards a supply chain example. Now, one of the uh, newer supply, not it's not newer, it's been around, but I think people have started doing it now, that signing containers, right? We are Previously, everyone used to talk about signing containers. Nobody used to do it. But today, because we have cosign and we have uh, those projects, it's become much easier to sign and verify container images. Now, let's say we want to set up a policy within a Kubernetes cluster to say that only allow signed images in this cluster with this, which have been signed based on this public-private key pair, which is this public, and give it a public key reference so that if any other type of image uh, is trying to get launched in that container, it just doesn't allow it because the signature doesn't match or the key that it's been signed with does not match. So that's the idea behind our example here. So let's look at the policy. So here we have a policy that says verify image. We are essentially validating uh, failure actions. We're essentially saying enforce it. Kiverno has a very cool uh, flag called background as well. Now, what does background do? If you turn the background colon true, it will actually give you a, a set of, it gives you a report of all the violations that have been hap that have happened in the previous containers launch. So let's say you're obviously launching it to a live uh, cluster, right? So in this case, if you set the background true, it will give you an audit statement saying, hey, these are the containers that have not been signed. So you might want to take immediate action on it. Right, so background, it's pretty cool from that standpoint. So what we're going to do here is essentially going to say that, look, um, any image needs to be, first of all, the image needs to fr come from this particular registry, and the key needs to be this. It needs to be, this is the public key that we're referencing. Right? It's signed with, obviously, the private key that we don't need, but the public key reference is going to be this. So if it does not, if it is not signed with the private key that corresponds to this public key, does, do not allow it, right? That's basically what we're trying to do. So now let's actually go ahead and try and launch two images, one obviously signed correctly and one obviously unsigned. Let's try and see how that works out. So I'm going to try and launch, and I've already loaded this policy into my cluster. It's already ready to go. Um, or have I? Let me just recheck. Last thing you want is, oh, I don't think I have loaded it. Oh, it's already there, okay. Let me just add this. I think I forgot to add this. Yeah, okay. So now I'm gonna try and load an unsigned image. So this image that we have is 
unsigned. This is not signed, right? So ideally, this should not work. Because now we have a policy within the Kubernetes cluster that says, check the signature. If the signature doesn't match, throw it out. So now let's launch the unsigned variant. And it immediately says, nope. It has to be signed as per the policy that you've set up. And you can restrict this to a namespace. You can restrict it based on labels. You can do all kinds of very specific actions. You can restrict it. I mean, you can keep it cluster-wide. You can keep it namespaced. You can have it at different stages, at different uh, parts of your cluster, right? or at different uh, scopes of your cluster. So this is not working. But if I try and launch a, let's say I, this is signed with a different a private key which does not correspond to the public key that we have, it's still going to say no because it does not correspond to the public key. But finally, if we launch the signed container image, which is the actual valid one, it says, yeah, I allow it to go through. Right? So the idea behind using policy as code is for you to be able to offload policy management, policy enforcement decisions to purpose-built tools. And when you are using distributed systems, when you're using, especially when you're running a lot of APIs or microservices and things like that, this is an essential thing that you need to have. Because without this, it becomes very hard to start. And you, I mean, you can do it with SAST-based things. You can check the YAML manifest. You can check all of that stuff. You can still do it. But the problem is that the uh, there is still no last resort. It's not defense in depth. If it passes through one of your SAS checks or your CICD checks, then it's all the way through to the production or potentially production environment that you have. So policy management is essential. You need to, it's, it's really a powerful way to enforce consistent secure defaults. That's really what we want. Now, I'm not saying this is the only thing you need to do for secure defaults, obviously not. But this is definitely one of the key things you should be thinking of for creating those paved roads. All of us talked about paved roads. We talk about security faults. We should be able to uh, use this to be able to have that consistent uh, enforcement of secure defaults so that developers don't have to think about it every single time. Every time somebody is coming up with a Kubernetes manifest, they don't have to think about it all the time. It's basically enforced, and by the time it gets to a, a Kubernetes cluster and rolled out, it's enforced at, at that particular point in time. So distributed systems, it brings more order. It gets more complex as we go. Uh, so that's one of the reasons you should have policy as code. And of course, the thing with policy as code is you have purpose-built tools that you can use across the stack. So we saw two examples. There are several more that you can use, right? So these are some examples of what you can do with policy as code. I've just explained two stories, but like I said, there are lots of other implementations possible. N nearly every, uh, every uh, cloud environment, even CI environments, for instance, uh, there's a CI tool called Harness that has open policy agent built natively into it. You can use that for enforcing CI CD guardrails and checks. Uh, GitHub Actions has a lot of these as well that you can use. They are literally available at all levels of the stack, if you're thinking about it. So one of the things you should do is look at how this can work for you and start implementing it as much as you can, depending on your environment, your specific use cases, as you will. With that, uh, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. And like isn't it boring to me because just like this is a thread where some kind of try cross that and directly go to the back end. So I guess my first question is I assume it should be possible to do it maybe at the middleware in the application yeah. itself. Of course. Yeah. And the second question is like in your experience of like how, how do you compare these two things? I mean if the API is great, so assuming it's at middle of the web, is, is there a reason why you would prefer doing it in the API is great? So um, the, it's not necessarily a preference. It's really about the stack, I mean, the, the applications itself, right? It really comes down to an engineering decision, in my opinion, because if your applications, uh, let's say they have a lot of, it's very complex to re-engineer them or add a middleware in, in the middle of, I mean, between this and uh, 
the application, then it may be necessary to do it outside of it. Or uh, let's say you're starting off with a greenfield development, you may be able to just use this as some kind of a plugin with that. that both those things can happen. It really depends upon the engineering decisions you want to make or the engineering trade-offs that you want to take. Yeah, not, not just that, right? It also comes down to uh, how mature your team is in terms of understanding security, how they are able to uh, understand that this is a good thing and not something that is going to block them from doing things. It really depends upon a lot of those variables. It comes down to culture at that particular point in time, and that becomes a very, very gray area. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, not really, because yeah, no. Uh, again, it really depends on how you are using it. So, for instance, there is a better performance if you use both as binaries because they are they don't have to be used as server processes. So you can use them as inline processes. That is generally, both are written in Go, so it's generally pretty fast. They're, they're quite performant uh, from that standpoint. Open Policy Agent does have a pretty detailed, uh, you know, a pretty detailed guide on how you can improve performance. Casbin is, is really all about, so Casbin, the way Casbin is implemented is that it's a framework which is implemented by multiple libraries in multiple languages. So it really comes down to how that library is handling the performance of Casbin. So it's a little bit more subjective with Casbin, but with Open Policy Agent, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. In terms of the, the, the API gateway. Yeah. 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 Yes, of course. Correct, yes. So, how do you avoid the, the all the exposed server being single point of So, in the way that I would uh, compose the policy itself would be for things that are, you know, being built, and not negate things that are not in your policy definitions, right? Or at least have some kind of a testing with different environments and then run a bunch of tests to see whether, so for instance, you can use open policy agent with an open API specification and start to do some enforcement based off of that. So that is something you can do. But yes, this is just like any other code. It has to be tested in a non-prod environment. It has to go through the motions of CICD uh, as part of a build process and then get deployed somewhere where you know, it has been tested, validated. The good thing is you can do it. The good thing is you can. Whereas imagine trying to do authorization testing across maybe 1,000 different entities. It's just impossible to do. With this, you can roll out unit tests. They even tell you how many microseconds each unit test took to run. So you actually have very clear indicators of, uh, okay, this, uh, this is an authorization test we did. This failed. It failed, and it was valid because it failed because we tried to run a negative test case against it. So that's the kind of test you can run as part of your test suite. So just like you're running your unit test suite, you can include the unit test suite for Open Policy Agent as well. Yeah. All right. Any other questions before we close? Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.